everyone and welcome back. Though we did cover the ubiquitous cloche hat of the 1920s a few weeks back, we have not yet covered the other incredibly infamous version of 1920s fashion, the fringed flapper dress. Now, if you just simply look up flapper dress or 1920s dress, a variety of fringed options will be available to you for purchase or viewing through so many different types of media. It is considered probably the most standard version of 1920s attire, especially if you're going to a party. So why is it that I was taught with historical fashion education that this dress didn't actually exist? The fringed dress of the 1920s is simply a modern version that was made up by media later. It kind of gives me pause to question both sides because one side says it's incredibly popular and the other says it didn't exist. And we should know by now that never or always is not really a good way to approach historical fashion because a lot of things you don't expect to exist do and a lot of things that we remember very clearly from a certain era we're not nearly as popular as it seems. And the fringe dress is caught between an argument on the two sides. So what really did exist for evening wear in the 1920s? Was fringe a thing? And if it was, was it as much of a thing as we make it out to be? Or did it even look like those versions of fringe dresses? And this is something that I wanted to explore as I was working on a number of 1920s evening gowns for a vintage cruise. And all of this time spent there got me curious because I was finding a huge range of options, and to be honest, some of them have fringe. But before we dive into what fringe was in the 1920s, and while I am still on the topic of this massive month-long 1920s trip I just took, I have to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Care Of. Care Of is a subscription service that ships high-quality personalized vitamins to your door every month. It can be difficult on a regular day to keep up with what your body needs, but when you're traveling for a month, it's nearly impossible to make sure that you're eating right, getting enough sleep, and staying healthy when it is so incredibly important. But with Care Of, I can make sure that I not only support what I need at home, Home, but have an easy way to keep it up on the go. They provide an in-depth quiz about your health goals and give you personalized recommendations. Each result comes with a thorough description so you can understand how it fits into your life. And it's simple to amend if you have something you want to manually add as well, or to change and update your packs to match what you need right now. I refocus my plan supporting my energy and immunity on this trip, knowing that I was going to run myself ragged. Aside from my normal multivitamin, I focused on things like vitamin B complex and vitamin C. Not shockingly, fruits and veggies were hard to find on my trip. And with care of compostable daily packs, I was able to toss everything I need into my bag and go. That means I remembered it every day and made it through three countries and a whole ocean of travel, feeling great regardless of what my day entailed. Care Of makes the process of researching, sourcing, and even remembering to take your daily vitamins so simple. They talk at length about what goes into each option, so you know that what you're putting in your body is made from good-for-you, high-quality ingredients. Take Care Of's quiz to find out what's recommended for you, and use my code NicoleR50 to take 50% off your first month at Care Of. Thanks again to Care Of for sponsoring this week's video. Now, as for my giant 1920s trip and the evening gowns that I made for that, we will get into that shortly. But first, I want to explore the idea of fringe because it can be a lot of different things. But what it is in the 1920s is going to explain a lot of its usage. So there are many, many different ways that you can do fringe in lots of different cultures, in lots of different time periods. This is not a new thing by any means. And as you reach the 1920s, you'll see fringe out of so many different things. Chenille or wool, silk threads, feathers and beads. I saw ones that were little sequins being braided together. So there is a wide range of options when it comes to fringe in the 1920s. However, the complicated thing here is that most of these fringes are still done very much by hand. Even if we are talking about silk fringe, it is something that is silk thread, which is usually hand knotted in some fashion. So a great example of what early 1920s fringe looked like comes from this gown, which I was actually fortunate enough to see on my trip in the Leicestershire Museum. I have so many more things to show you that I got to explore there, but this gown is a perfect example of what fringe was being used. And you can see that it's hand knotted, hand stitched, that each individual section has to be done 
on the gown itself. It's not mass manufactured and just simply stitched on like you will find our modern fringe that when you go to say the fabric store and purchase. This is a little bit different and this is time consuming to make and to care for. These types of fringes can get tangled very easily and will fray over time. They do take maintenance and obviously by the fact that they are done by hand individually take a fair amount of time. Now obviously this doesn't mean that they didn't exist because if you look at 1920s evening dresses, the ones that survive in museums show an absolutely mind-blowing amount of effort when it comes to hand beading and embroidery and fringe and trimmings. There's a lot of time in these, but these are the ones that ended up in museums for a reason. These are the couture pieces. These are the very expensive pieces. These are not necessarily the mass manufactured everyday ownership pieces. And so while you will find fringe being used on a lot of very fashionable evening gowns, many of the mentions that I find throughout the 1920s, because there isn't one single moment that fringe came in or went out, it seems consistently mentioned for evening garments throughout the entirety of the decade. They mention it being used on the edges of shawls or the ends of wraps around the hem or perhaps to grace the chest area to really accentuate something. That fringe was used in a very meaningful way. The gown at Leicestershire Museum is a great example of this. When you move it, you can see just how that fringe sways back and forth. It is elegant and beautiful and eye-catching and it's understandable why fringe was a popular option on a lot of these evening garments and some day wear ones as well. Though the longer fringes seem much more practical for evening attire as they aren't going to necessarily stand up to day to day wear in the same way. But the thing that we really focus on here is these are expensive and our version of the 1920s fringe dress is usually tied to the flapper. And though what the flapper is, is a pretty broad concept and a little hard to nail down, it seems to be more a matter of who identified as a flapper more so than a set of rules for what one is because they were around for a number of years. It's honestly though, more an early 1920s thing than a later 1920s thing. By the mid 1920s, there are plenty of articles saying that the flapper is dead and gone and the fashions are out and really people aren't doing that much anymore. But the flapper of the early 1920s is known by their more youthful fashions, by the fact that they are wearing things that are fun and bright, shorter hems, things that allow for movement and just spontaneity in a sense. So the fashions are moving very quickly, the flapper fashions are moving even faster, and if you've watched some of my other videos, you may know that this really is the height of the beginning of fast fashion, where things are made out of thin and cheap fabrics, worn really quickly, worn out, and tossed out. Because fashion is changing so quickly, why bother to buy something expensive that you can only wear for a few months anyway? So the flappers were definitely connected with that concept of fast fashion before it was named so. And Things like really lengthy, long, elegant fringe that has to be lovingly cared for and is really expensive, while not something that I can guarantee no flappers ever wore, doesn't really fit with the flapper mindset and lifestyle as much. I'm sure there were some very wealthy flappers who wore the most absolutely exquisite and expensive gowns and ripped them to shreds every night, but it's not as common of a thing. And when you see the images of what flappers were wearing for dresses, they don't look like the evening gowns that are covered in long trailing fringe made out of exquisite brocades and beaded textiles. The question then becomes, if we have fringe dresses of the 1920s and we have flapper dresses of the 1920s, where did these two become synonymous? And the answer starts in 1927, after the flapper's really starting to fade, and well, fringe is still around, it is still a popular thing for dresses, but it hasn't really gone through any sort of major boom at this point. There's not one year that it was more popular than another. But in 1927, chainette fringe is invented, and this revolutionizes fringe as a cheap and easy to care for commodity. This is what you're going to find in stores today. The thing that makes this different is unlike the other types of silk fringe that are a twisted silk, this is done with a chain, and one end gets woven into a braid, and then the loops down at the bottom can be cut if you want them to be. This won't unravel, it won't fray out, it won't tangle, and it's already on its own band, so you just have to 
machine stitch that band onto the fabric, onto the dress, really fast and easy, which makes fringe much more accessible in a mass production facility mindset. So you would think perhaps there's an explosion of fringe at this time. I wasn't really finding one, though there are some mentions of it being a lot easier and cheaper now. So there doesn't seem to be a major popularity shift in fringe. It just keeps showing up. Great examples though of a use of this type of fringe and large quantities of this type of fringe, of course, come from designers like Vionnet, who is well known for her use of fringe on dresses to not just finish off the edge, but to literally create designs on the gown to actually create the interest on a relatively simple shape with a great deal of fringe. And this is where we start to see things that look a bit more like that ubiquitous 1920s fringe dress, but it's still, again, a couture house. It's not mass produced, it's not just everywhere. And it's the combination of these images and fashion styles that we remember from the 1920s and the availability of cheap and easy fringe that coalesce by the time we reach the 1940s. We're actually starting to see representations in the media at this time of the 1920s, where movies and plays are showing their version of the 1920s, which isn't really that long ago, and certainly enough people are alive that remember it, so they can't go completely off book when it comes to the way these people are supposed to look, but they can now do really expensive looking gowns in a very cheap way when it comes to fringe. And this is especially the case when it comes to things like movie musicals. There's a lot of movement, there's a lot of frenetic energy, and when they're representing the 1920s, and especially the flapper, they're trying to represent that energy, that vivacity, and movement of the dance of that era. So the movement is amplified by these fringe dresses that are shaking every which way and throwing out all of this extra movement. And so it only makes sense that that becomes a popular version of the 1920s in things like Singing in the Rain, where they not only have a very exquisite couture style fringe dress, but they also have a lot of the extras, especially in things like big musical or dream sequences, they love putting them in these mass produced fringe dresses to really over amplify the movement. So it's a combination of things that kind of actually existed, but in a use that wasn't really the case, but makes sense for later. And between the movies and the representation of fringe dresses equaling flapper dresses, it takes hold very quickly. And so when they say the 1920s is back in the late 1950s or in the 1970s or any era where it seems to be a retro style, because that's a thing much further back than today, they are showing fringe dresses. They are synonymous. 1920s equals flapper equals fringe. And that becomes the vision that we have of it and thus is born by the 1970s, the quintessential flapper outfit where they have a sequined elastic band around their forehead, a little feather sticking out of it, a tube of a dress covered in some type of fringe with possibly even more sequins that is frankly more mini dress level than actual flapper level, and that's what we go with. So fringe dresses in the 1920s certainly did exist, although they weren't synonymous at all with flappers, but they don't seem to be the most common option, or at least the most prevalent one. Which leads me to wonder, what were the options for evening gowns in the 1920s? And the answer to that is so many different things. They were incredibly, incredibly creative in this era, and they really didn't have rules of what it should or shouldn't be. They adored color and texture combined in ways that we wouldn't normally do it, and they had no rules, it seems, in terms of what was supposed to be the general structure, shape, size, coverage, anything like that. So you will find gowns that are simply tubes. You will find others that have very full and ruffled skirts. You will find some that have entire full body coverage on top, while others have next to nothing up there and everything in between. So there really isn't one type of gown that is simply a 1920s evening gown. It would be even difficult to do that year by year because there are so many styles every single year. I've made three 1920s evening gowns in the past and I just made three for this trip and none of them really look the same. The very first one I ever made is from the early 1920s. It's a panier style, which is 
referring to the side hoops that are 18th century style in their inspiration. And this particular one is based off of an original that was sold by Fab Gabs about a decade ago. And I at the time did not have the monetary ability to purchase originals. So I based this construction off of the pictures that she had online of this very beautiful piece. And this is the final result that I was actually able to take with me to Berlin and go to a 1920s style party while there. But this style is something that was popular not only from the couturiers, but was also a little more widely available as well. It seems to be a pretty popular shape, though what fabric you make it out of or what trim you add is much more broad. The next up is a very simple straight black silk dress with a beaded top portion. The beading on top is partially antique and partially me needing more of it, and so I replicated it myself, much more 1919 to 1921. And though we aren't dealing with the drop waist era of the mid-1920s that will be so popular later, there isn't a distinct waist to this, there isn't a distinct shaping, but it does cling to the body in a way that still show some curves. This actually was kept incredibly simple with just the beading around the top and some bugle beads around the edges in order to match with the coat that I made for this, which is an Urte style. And he was a very famous artist of the Art Deco style. So the cape is the point to this whole ensemble and is really quite distinct. Next up, I have this red velvet version, which is based off of a Worth fashion plate from 1921-22. It's got a triangular shape in the front, really low back. The pink silk is what covers enough to make it I don't know, decent, I guess, or at least danceable in as I found so I can move around and not be worried about things. Very simple construction and very comfortable to wear. Not unlike the general shape of the black one, it is just really a simple, very long straight tube, but is still fairly different in its styling. Moving forward though into the three for my trip. The first was also based off of a Worth fashion plate from 1922, and this is a very simple style, which is really unfitted. It's got a swag of a sash around the hips to hold it tight there with a little bit of extra zhuzh on the side, but it's not terribly shaped. I ended up with mine being made out of a silk velvet that is a burnout velvet and it's really comfortable. It's a really simple design too. This I was fortunate enough that I cut the whole thing out and handed it off to my mother who helped me out while I was on a different trip by making this garment while I was gone. And then we got together and I put the sashes on and made sure everything fit up correctly, added this little antique piece on the side as well. And it's come together really nicely. I know it is not going to be everyone's particular favorite style, because it doesn't flatter the figure in the way that we are used to with modern curves and shaping. It's very indicative of the era and the lack of curves, but I love the fact that it's a longer style and it was so incredibly comfortable to wear. Definitely something I will pull back out for perhaps a breakfast or tea situation as well, because it is just so easy to lounge about in. The other two gowns I made for the trip, I do have some footage of me working through the draping process and the patterning process. I have a lot more for this black gown that I made than I do for this version of a gown that I made in a yellow and gold silk because the yellow one I made in the last two days before I left. And I actually never got to try it on before the trip, but it ended up being, of course, the thing that gets the most compliments when you go to wear it. It's the thing that you spent the least amount of time on always, but I actually don't have a ton of footage of the construction for that one because at some point it came down to, I just need to have this done in my luggage. So there is some, and I will try and walk through the choices that I made in the construction that I did, even the parts that I didn't catch on camera. Of course, these were some of the pieces that I got to wear on my vintage cruise. So you will get a little preview of that as well, but I was also inspired to do a bit of a more fancy photo shoot after I got back because I felt like these gowns just needed a little bit more time to themselves outside of the chaos of the actual cruise. The complicated part of this dress, since it is just a simple tube, is the little swag on the side where, as you can see, it doesn't curve under with those gathers at the base. So this is something that I'm going to have to drape on a mannequin to make sure that I get the fall to hang correctly. There's a slip that goes underneath that I've already made and that allows me something to pin to. 
The first question I had was, do I have to have a side seam? Is one width of this fabric, because it's a pretty wide fabric, enough to wrap around the entire body and gather up? But that depends on the angle and size of those gathers. So this is what I'm playing with at this point. Is there enough width to this fabric for that to work? And the answer is no, very much no. So you can see it's kind of pulling under and that's what we're trying to avoid at the base where it's pulling in and the gathers aren't falling straight down. They're pulling to the side. They're sort of swooping under. And I'm trying to avoid that because that's going to restrict my movement. So I am cutting a separate back and then the underskirt uh, was added to the front that only goes up roughly to the hips. The front piece is then added where I've got the shaping done at the top for what the neckline and the armholes will be. The side seam on the left side of the body is just the edge of the fabric. So I have the entire width of the fabric to figure out what this shape needs to be. So I just get to play with draping, how much pleating, how far over, do I do it at an angle, do I do it straight down? And that's what I'm fidgeting with here because there's a lot of fabric in this space right now. And I'm going to try and cut away parts of it as I go, which is a little bit daunting, but the initial part is just sort of scrunching the fabric up and figuring out what happens if I put fullness here, what happens if I move it two inches to the left, etc, etc. So at this point I've figured out roughly where that horizontal line needs to be in order to make the fullness work. So you can see I've got this little uh, piece that's folding down in front and then the gathers happen and then there's a swag off to the side. So it's not just gathering straight up, it's got this weird little folded piece that's sort of dangling to the inside of the pleats. So that's what I'm working on at this point, figuring out where that top line needs to be and how much to gather in to it. Once I have figured that out, then I can start trimming away the fullness to make sure that it's hanging correctly once it's got just a single layer rather than a whole bunch of fabric sort of crammed into that section. You can see it's too tall right now and there's just too much there. So I'm going in, I marked it with pins and I am trimming a probably an inch, inch and a half away from those pins just to give myself some extra. I can true it up when it's laying out flat on the table later. Right now I just need to get rid of that bulk and I guarantee I won't need any of that. So now we have a much cleaner little piece that sticks out in front. It folds much more nicely. It's not crammed full of extra fabric. So I've got that added there. I've pleated roughly to see what happens when I do that. I will go back and true up those pleats at the end and once I'm sure that they're about where they need to be and the hem is about where it needs to be, I'm going in and finally cutting out the upper shapes of the neckline for the front and back. Front is a high neck, the back is a low V. Then I am putting together the side seams. I'm just using a simple French seam for this process. Wrong sides together, flip it, right sides together, stitch it again. So that way everything is contained in the side seams. There's not a lot going on there, just the shoulders and the sides. The sides are a little bit complicated because of that underskirt, but it's not too bad. The next step is finishing off all of those necklines. That's the part that I can guarantee is correct. I can put that on my body and say, yes, that's really clear. I'm doing that with a bias tape and I'm just machine stitching that, flipping it back and hand tacking it down. That is the fastest way to deal with it in the fact that it's got a curve in the front and a V in the back, which means it comes to a point. So roll hemming isn't going to work well with that point. The bias tape is going to be able to cover that up and hold it really securely a lot better. Once the neckline is taken care of, it's time to go to the hem, which I trued up. I put it back on the mannequin once things were seamed together and made sure that it was pretty even, cleaned it up, and I am just roll hemming it with machine stitching because I am not going to take the time to hand stitch something when it is barely visible on this fabric. Once that is done, I am going to go and hand stitch all those pleats in place because getting that up into the machine is just really difficult and I don't want visible lines of stitching across each one of those. It will be more obvious than the hem. So I'm going in by hand and going through each one of the edges to stitch it down through a lot of the layers in each case to make sure that it is tacked through that underskirt and it's really secure. The underskirt you can see just roll hem on top and that just ends right at the top of the hip and roll hem down on the side as well and then it just gets tacked to the side seam just top two inches. If you go the whole way down, it will be a straight tube and you will have no room to move your legs. So that has to be loose under that, sort of like a wrap dress, but 
uh, stitched at the upper portion of the body on the right side. So it's somewhere between a wrap dress and a tube dress. I don't know. But the fall there, you can see really nice gathers, really uh, solid construction in that area. It's the only place there'll be stress. The second dress is a bit funky in its shaping, so we're gonna have to figure out what shape gets that skirt and what shape manages that top where the front and the backs are connected and straight under the arms. So that'll be the fun part. Dress will not have a slip, but I put one on the mannequin just to have something to anchor into a little bit more easily. There's a little bit of gathering in the front. I'm working with the long width of the fabric. So the selvage edge is the top of the waist right now. This is sort of using the fabric itself to drape a mock-up. So gathering along the front, and then I'm able to pin to the slip at the bottom to make sure that it stays tight to the slip. I only want it to be so big at the bottom that I can walk and that's it. But the top needs the extra. So essentially it's going to be straight in the front and then curve down is where the final shape will be. It'll be really obvious uh, when I lay it out flat, but I'm going to need all this fullness at the top. So that's what I'm trying to drape and I'm figuring out how long does this garment need to be? Again, the slip is helping me with that because I know I like the length of where that hits on my body. So I'm able to use that as a reference even though it won't be under this garment in its final format. I'm also going ahead and roughing up the other side just so I can see the balance of this. There will be gathers in the back, there will be um, a little bit of extra work to get the shaping correct once I lay it out flat, but for right now it looks pretty good. The only complaint that I have is it's a little bit too full at the hem. It looks a little bit too 19 teens rather than early 1920s, so I will be adjusting that. The pattern laid out, I couldn't see pins on it and chalk marks were just really difficult, so I used tailor's tape and pinned that. That became my stitch line that was really obvious, so that way I could cut outside of that line and play around with where it was going to curve and fall, make sure it was all even, measure up the back seam so it was the right length along the sides, get everything really clear and also a nice straight edge in the back. So that is one of my big tips if you're working with something like this and you're gonna be moving it around and reshaping it, pin down tape because it's really obvious where your pattern is at that point. So you can see the curve that is the back section. The front section is just sort of straight on the grain. Um, and this can only get so big before it hits selvages and edges. I moved it out so that way I wasn't wasting any fabric and then cut a pretty wide seam allowance. I put it back on the mannequin after this once the whole thing was cut out both sides, I just fold it in half and cut out the other side to match and put it back on the mannequin roughly to see if it worked. It did. So at that point, I then decided I needed to cut out a full lining for this because it's a really rough and scratchy fabric on the back side. And honestly, it was going to be a lot faster construction than hand stitching hems and things like that. The only downside is that once I hemmed them together at the bottom, I went and seamed them in the back, seamed them together at the bottom. The one fabric for the lining is a little bit looser weave. And so I had to adjust how they matched up for this little opening on the side. That will get seamed right side to right side and the edges turned in, whereas at the waist, the edges will stick out. Then it came time to deal with the top. It's a very weird shape. The straight edge goes from the top under the arm and back up again, and there's two triangles. This was just how big does that triangle need to be to cover me decently. Then the chiffon layer goes under it, very similar shape, though slightly different angle for things. And I did put some extra into the chiffon to gather it under the chest. So that way it uh, forms and shapes better for coverage reasons. <laughs> the back gets done a little funky because it's not going to be straight down at an angle. It's going to meet up at like a button in the mid back. So it's a little funky, but I'm utilizing what I can off the chiffon, meaning that it's doubled over. So the folded edge is what goes under the arm. The front edge is the really nice selvage edge. And then the back is where I'm going to have to actually do some stitched seams. So there will be the straight seam that comes from the shoulder down to the midpoint on the back. And then at some point, once I try it on and figure out where it is, it will cut across at a 90 degree angle but I need to have this roughly cut out and tacked into the garment in order to figure out where this needs to match on my back in order to actually fold correctly. So I'm cutting out two of these. You can see I went ahead and stitched the seam for one of them. So those two points will be where the shoulders are. That gathered portion goes under the chest in front and all of this just gets shoved into a waistband that everything gets seamed and then I bind over. 
the top. So it's a very simple construction on the interior. This is the part where I sped up really fast, where everything gets gathered down, stitched together. You can see the folded edge of the chiffon there. They match up at the very top points. Everything's hand stitched at that top point together, sort of just tacked. There's not a seam up there. Um, the front edge, again, the selvage edges, which are really nice. And then the very back corner becomes the button and loop. I did have a little bit of trouble getting this to stay together, stay buttoned, but I might just adjust how that's shaped for the loop later. You can see it's a weirdly simple shape and construction process, but they're, they're weird, weird shapes. So gathering under the bust to fit a little bit better, ignore the safety pins. That's for a large brooch that is safety pinned to the front temporarily because it's not permanently attached. And um, the last piece is the train down the back, which is just a tube that is finished off at both ends. It is stitched halfway onto the waistband, and then the other side just has a little hook and eye to finish it off. Hook and eye for the waistband as well. So very simple construction. Mm -hmm. 